the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. In 1889, Pope Leo XIII wrote the letter Quam Quam Plurias, in which he further pronounced, following his predecessors, on the special role of St. Joseph in the protection of the church and the elevated state this holy patriarch occupies, standing in such proximity as he does to the Virgin Mother of God and to the incarnation itself. Now yesterday, Father Quirk gave us a fascinating account of the typology or the prefiguring in the Old Testament between Joseph and our Lord. And here in today is a wonderful example of the multiple interrelated layers that exist in the scriptures. Not just one meaning is present in the sacred writings, but many, not just the literal, but the mystical, not just of the past, but of the future. Our Joseph of the Old Testament prefigured our savior in his abandonment, in his being sold for pieces of silver, in his apparent rising from the dead. Pope Leo reminds us of his foreshadowing of Saint Joseph. The first Joseph, he tells us, won the good will of his master, and through his administration, his household came to prosperity. He presided over them with great power and provided for all the needs of Egypt in the time of strife with such wisdom that the king called him the savior of the world. As the first Joseph protected and defended a kingdom, the second protected and defended none other than the kingdom or the household of the Holy Family, of the Holy Virgin and the Christ Child. So also, says Pope Leo, should he be regarded, therefore, as the protector and defender of the church, which is that divine child's household now on earth. Let us look at what our pontiff Leo thinks about the necessity for a defender and protector of the church. Now, venerable brethren, you know the times in which we live. They are scarcely less deplorable for the Christian religion than the worst days, which in times past were full of misery for the church. We see faith, the root of all Christian virtues, lessening in many souls. We see charity growing cold, the young generation daily growing in depravity of morals and views. The church of Jesus Christ, attacked on every side by open force or by craft, a relentless war waged against the sovereign pontiff and the very foundations of religion undermined with a boldness which waxes daily in intensity. These things are indeed so much a matter of notoriety that it is needless for us to ex expatiate on the depths to which society has sunk in these days or on the designs which now agitate the minds of men. In circumstances so unhappy and troubles, human remedies are insufficient and it becomes necessary as a sole resource to beg for assistance from the divine power. But, as we, as we know, Pope Leo is talking about the world in 1889. One can only imagine what he would think and write in this our day, with the long litany of assaults against God and man that you have all heard me recite all too frequently, about the complete rejection of him in society, the bloodthirsty eradication of the rights of his unborn, the manipulation of their remains in the name of science, and now the explicit and obvious financially motivated and power-hungry desire for war at all costs. If Leo would call the entire church to pray with even more piety and constancy in 1889, what then is left for us to do in a society up to its neck in blood and death in 2022? Now let us consider for a moment the complementary complementarity rather of the prayer to the spouse of the one we already run to with piety and devotion. If on numeral occasions, he says, she has displayed her power in aid of the Christian world, why should we doubt that she will now renew the assistance of her power and favor? We judge it therefore of deep utility for the Christian people continually to invoke with great piety and trust together with the Virgin Mother of God, her chaste spouse, the Blessed Joseph, and we regard it as most certain that this will be most pleasing to the Virgin herself. Saint Joseph, the great writers and saints tell us, has preeminence over all the saints his holy spouse accepted. And for this reason, 
as St. Thomas Aquinas tells us. An exceptional divine mission, he says, calls for a corresponding degree of grace. This is why the soul of Christ received the absolute fullness of grace. Why the Blessed Virgin herself, destined to be the mother of God, received the fullness of grace from the moment of her conception. It's why the apostles were given a more perfect knowledge of the mysteries of faith, as St. Paul says. And so too of dear St. Joseph. Father Garigou Lagrange adds another element, that all works which are ordered directly to God himself are perfect. Creation, ordered by him directly, was perfect. His servants, those chosen directly by him, are given the corresponding grace necessary for their calling. Joseph must have received the proportionate measure of grace for his calling to be the ostensible father of the Christ child and defender, protector, and spouse of his mother. Those given a special divine mission by God himself are given all the grace necessary to fulfill that mission. And yet, Joseph's mission was higher even than that of the apostles. While their mission was on the level of sanctifying grace, sanctifying the church, his mission was ordered directly to God himself. Theirs is astonishing in its magnitude, but his is even higher. St. Joseph's preeminence in sanctity then stems from the primary mission he was given to be the foster father of the Son of God and protector of both him and his mother. But this is truly in the past. What then for St. Joseph in 2022 when the world has sunk to such depths that would make a 19th century pontiff shudder? Pope Leo again sees in the hidden silent mission of Joseph 2,000 years ago the reason for his vital and powerful role now in our day. As Mary, mother of the Savior, is the spiritual mother of all Christians, Joseph looks on all Christians as having been confined to himself. He says, so as he was defender of the household of the Christ child two millennia ago, so he is also its protector and intercessor now. The same grace granted to Joseph for such a mission to directly minister to God on earth is the same grace that animates his actions now in 2022, excelled only by the Blessed Virgin herself. Finally, Joseph's compelling appeal also extends to all elements of mankind. He points out the way to true virtue to all of them. To those of noble birth, he shows true humility. His labor is to the creator of the world, and yet he is a simple carpenter. His actions are primarily spiritual, and yet, as St. Teresa of Avila reminds us, he excels in things temporal. He is an example to fathers, a defender of mothers and of virgins and of the dying. One of the titles we also attribute to him is Terror of Demons. As the world accelerates in its thirst for death, for war, for power, for control, when all around the walls of the church, the world that seems to encroach upon it, to suffocate, to strangle it, here are two intercessors and defenders that have been given the grace, perfect grace and sufficient for their sublime missions, either to minister and protect the Son of God himself or to do the same for us. They did not fail him in their first mission and they will of course not fail us in this last one. These things are indeed so much a matter of notoriety, Leo says, that it is needless for us to exp exp on the depths to which society has sunk. We judge it therefore of deep utility for the Christian people continually to invoke with great piety and trust together with the Virgin Mother of God, her chaste spouse, the blessed Joseph. And we regard it as most certain that this will be most pleasing to the Virgin herself. May Saint Joseph continue to intercede, protect and defend us on our war with the world that encroaches upon us and upon the church especially as we come to the war internally in Lent. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.